It's innovation and business models that creates growth. Before we start, I want to thank our sponsor, Next Estate, specialists for buying, selling, and managing properties in the Berlin market in Germany. You can find Next Estate at next-estate.com. The way I'm going to introduce today's episode is by reading the forward by Clayton Christensen to this book, Reinvent Your Business Model. It goes like this. More than a decade ago, Mark Johnson, SAP's Henning Kagerman, and I hashed out the principles of business model reinvention in the pages of the Harvard Business Review. Mark was my student at Harvard Business School, and we went on to co-found the consultancy Inosight together. In the years since, he has become my teacher as well as my partner and friend, which is about the most gratifying thing any professor can say about a former student. If our work on business model innovation has more than held up over the years, the term itself has become somewhat of an empty cliche or even a buzz phrase, so much so that we have been tempted at times to retire the term. That's a shame because a deep understanding of the underlying principles of business models is an incredibly powerful tool, not just for management theorists, but for practitioners. Knowing how to build or rebuild a seamless business model is what allows the strongest leaders to stave off disruption from their competitors while driving innovation in their own enterprises. Essentially, a business model can be broken into four distinct elements. A value proposition, resources, processes, and a profit formula. I like to imagine that each of these four elements has a dial on it. When they are all set correctly, both the customer and the company receive what they need. However, between the time that the company designs, builds, and ships its first order, and the time that it ships its 10 millionth, the settings on the dials will have been changed many times. Those dials rarely change in isolation. If the setting on one conflicts with with another, that other dial setting must change as well. This is why change, especially disruptive change, is so hard to do. Because the more innovative a customer value proposition is, the less likely it is to be compatible with the resources, processes and profit formulas that the business was originally built on. What this means in practice is that the new and different must be separated and even protected from the tried and the true. As Mark says, to play a new game on a new field requires a new game plan. Those are the words of Clayton Christensen from Reinvent Your Business Model. It is a pleasure to welcome the gentleman who wrote this book and also co-authored that paper in 2008, along with Clayton Christensen. He's a great friend of the show who kindly endorsed my own book. He is also the author of multiple titles over my shoulder here, some of which will come to in the future, some of which we've covered in the past. It is a great pleasure to welcome to this tribute to his friend, Clayton Christensen, Mark Johnson. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Aiden. It's uh, great to be here. It's always great to have you on the show, man. We covered in the past your great book, Lead from the Future, one that I absolutely love and hope to recover again in the future because it's never out of date, as this article that you co-authored back in 2008 shows as well. But I thought before we even delve into that article as part of this tribute to Clay Christensen, we talk about your great friendship and Many of our audience wouldn't have known that he was a student. You were a student of his back in the day, and you became great friends, and you went on to become business partners, and indeed co-author together. Let's talk about that and the origins of your relationship. Sure. Yeah. Well, we we first met when um, I took his inaugural innovation course, managing innovation. It's a little bit of a rite of passage, I think, for Harvard business school professor to, to be able to develop their own course. And he had been an assistant professor for a few years, offering up the standard first year courses. And uh, I ventured off to do his passion, which was around managing, managing innovation and introducing his concept of disruptive technology, which became disruptive innovation. And there was only 12 of us in the class because it was the first class and it was 
you know, take a chance on this new course. But that just made it amazing. It was people that were really passionate about the idea of innovation. And um, we, in many ways, became almost like his guinea pigs in some of the ideas that we had. You know, in fact, I think he wrote about one of the students' projects about creating an electric minivan. And he wrote about that in The Innovator's Dilemma. So that's where we really forged both my, we forged a friendship, but I also just forged my deep respect and admiration for not only his brilliance as a professor and as a teacher, but his goodness as a human being. And we ended up having the opportunity to go and collaborate when I, when I graduated from business school and went on to, to Booz Allen and Hamilton, we did some collaboration there. And that, that's when it led to us deciding that we would try to work together in a more concentrated way. It's great, man. I, lo I love the origin story and many people missed that as well. And how you guys got together, bounced ideas off each other and how you developed all these books, etc. And I just want to remind our audience over my shoulder there, you'll see reinventing your business model and its predecessor, which was seizing the white space as well. They are where the origins and the ideas of these came together for you, Mark, when you wrote that article with Clay and ending that I, that article 2008, reinventing your business model. But also it's available in this Clay Christensen reader. And I want to just say it again. It's a top 50 article of all time <laughs> for HBR and it's available also <laughs> on HBR.org. I, let's get into the the content and I'm going to open up the way you do in that article as well in because it's so interesting to look back and see how certain things played out and we see the thinking that you had back then how important it was and how it was such a competitive advantage here's how this article starts in 2003 Apple introduced the iTunes store revolutionizing portable entertainment creating a new market and transforming the company. In just three years, the iPod and iTunes combination became an early $10 billion product, accounting for almost 50% of Apple's revenues back then. Apple's market cap catapulted from around 1 billion in early 2003 to over 150 billion by late 2007. We know where it is now, it's a $3 trillion company. This success story is well known but what's so interesting is that what's less known is that Apple was not the first to bring digital music players to the market. A company called Diamond Multimedia introduced the Rio in 1998, and another firm, Best Data, introduced the Cabo 64 in 2000. Both products worked well and were portable and stylish. So why did the iPod succeed rather than the Rio or the Cabo? Over to you, Mark. It's still a fascinating story to me after all these years is you see all of these different companies that were well before Apple and the design and development of MP3 players. Um, and as you mentioned, those companies, Best Data and, the, and then the Rio. On the Rio side, it wasn't just the Rio Riot or the Rio Diamond. It was also the Rio Riot. So they had different models. There was a company called Creative that had their own MP3 player. And so it's just fascinating to see, you know, all of these technology leaders, if you will, that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, because they weren't able to crack the problem. I mean, they, they, they got part of the way with the idea of portability and to be able to customize so you could have the kind of music you wanted in your pocket. But they couldn't crack the ultimate problem, especially for a consumer good, which was to make it, to make it simple, to make it easy. To, to and and the technology wasn't going to get you there for that attribute you needed to wrap the business model around the technology by combining the service of Apple iTunes with the software and the product together to be able to enable uh you know to be able to enable that to to happen 
just a reminder, 2008 is when you wrote this and you had been doing the research for at least a year before then. So at that time, many organizations were talking about disruption and they were talking about they would used the term not in the same term way that Clay meant it, but they talked about disruption to their business as usual. And many of them talked about the need for reinvention or to change the organization, etc. But as you identified back then, very few talked about business model reinvention, or that any of those transitions or transformations were business model related. I'd love you to take us through if that's changed, if people are starting to look to business models as a way to reinvent the business, or have they still grasped the concept? You know, I, I, I would give, I guess, two aspects to it. I mean, I, I certainly think there's more attention to what is a business model. You know, the, the language is developed through the articles and books that I've written and written with Clay. Um, you know, there are other authors that have, have written about it. There's more research in universities, no question about it. Um, I think that there has been uh, more effort within corporations it's in particular to identify and understand business model and business model innovation. Um, I don't have the empirical evidence to sort of say, you know, here was a survey of the awareness back then. And here's a survey of the awareness in the, in the action today. Uh, I haven't done that research. It would be interesting, but just anecdotally, you know, in my travels, I would say, there is an increase, but it's woefully behind where it's needed, especially when you think about what's happening with digital and digital transformation, which it's not, again, really about the technology. It's, it's about what it does to the business model and business model management and understanding where the success is going to happen. But I think what gets in the way is... Uh, with incumbent organizations, it's the organizational challenge. It's the the rules, norms, and metrics. It's the cultural barriers that are getting in the way of of seeing business model innovation really flourish. And so, I think over these last whatever it is, these last 14, 15, 16 years. There's been progress, but it's woefully behind where it could be to creating value because of just in how entrenched uh, existing business models and the associated rules, norms and metrics and culture that goes with it sits as a barrier to being able to allow new business models to even see the light of day. If there's one thing our audience w will be aware of mark from this series on clay from this tribute series is they'll understand the idea of a new growth market and they'll understand non-consumption and you highlighted in that article that new business models often look unattractive to the incumbent at the out outset and in order to see past those borders as you put it back then you introduced this three-step roadmap and i thought that was really really helpful to get beyond not just as you said the entrenched business model, but also the entrenched mental model of the organization, and to be able to see opportunity where it looks like a step backwards. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, which has been deep in the Clay Christensen, um, you know, Innisight and, and other groups literature is the idea of jobs to be done, you know, really start deeply outside in. Um, before you even think about a business model or anything about it, you know, if you're really trying to to do this in the right way and develop from scratch, you deeply understand what the customer, the customer, the consumer is trying to get done. What are those important jobs to be done, we call it, which are problems to solve or needs to have that are important and unsatisfied. And you start there. And then you say, how would you address that job with a value proposition of product or service? Um, and, and so that is the other big challenge of a large organization is 
they tend to become entrenched in a way of doing things and they become very insular and inside out. You know, they say that they'll do consumer research or they'll, you know, kind of look at the markets. And of course they do, but there is a very high tendency to say, we have a product, we have a service, we provide it to the customer. If you're really trying to do something that's breakthrough to meet unmet needs or non-consumption or, or try to really reinvent something, you have to start again with the customer and make sure you're addressing an important and unmet job or unsatisfied job and, and then design what is not only the product or service, but how you actually distribute and price to that customer. And then you work back from that to say, how are we going to capture value? That's the profit formula. And how are we going to deliver that value repeatedly to the customer and repeatedly capture for ourselves? And that's the resources and processes. So those three steps are, you know, one, understanding the job to be done and have that real external focus Two, actually think about then the design of the value proposition, the business model. So the architecture and then three, know that you're never a priori going to get that system, that business model system approach right the first time there's empirical learning that has to take place. So step three is to take a test and learn approach, which is very consistent with the entrepreneur's mindset, you know, that we have to start in a foothold. We have to test and learn. We have to incubate before we accelerate because there's a whole set of assumptions which are embedded within a business model architecture construct that's done through the test and learn approach. There's a great example that you give in the article, which is the example of Dow Corning, and that brings everything together. We'll, we'll come to that in a moment, but I thought we'd share this part as well, because you said a business model from your point of view consists of four interlocking elements that taken together create and deliver value. They include a revenue model, a cost structure, a margin model, and resource velocity. I'm going to share, Mark, if it's okay with you, a diagram, and perhaps you'll talk to the diagram, and we'll have a bit of empathy for our audience who are listening to us, because most of our audience are listeners rather than, than viewers. So basically, you could take the first sort of tier level, and there are four big components, customer value proposition, profit formula, key resources, and key processes. As time has evolved since the article, we almost look at it as three big chunks, which is the customer value proposition, which is how do you create value to the customer? The profit formula is then how do you capture value for the company? And then I've actually taken now and put resources and processes together. Michael Porter would probably call it an activity system but, the th but that third bucket is how do you take resources and processes and put them together as an operating model, if you will, that allows you to repeatably cap deliver that value to the customer and repeatably capture the value to the company. Now, we break down each of those four boxes to a next level. A customer value proposition comprises the target customer the job to be done and the offering, which is not just product or service, but how you distribute in price. The profit formula, as you pointed out, is, is you know, think of it the, the way we think about it in everyday business, right? There's an income statement, there's a balance sheet, but we sort of zero in on a design of a profit formula is gonna be, you know, price times volume as a revenue model. Some things are high price, low volume. Some things are lower price, higher volume. Um, you have a cost structure, which includes direct and indirect costs uh, that then lead to a margin model. And then resource philosophy, velocity is just how fast you need to turn things through the system, the throughput, the inventory turns, which all that comes together, which needs us to say, does, helps determine what you're going to develop for revenues and overall profit and cash flow. And it's just interesting. The reason we get into that topic is because, you know, you might have a very high margin business that doesn't 
do a lot of inventory turns, but makes a lot of margin and a lot of money on each transaction, but has an opportunity to democratize and to hit a much broader population. Well, by definition, it's going to be needing to bring its price down and bring its cost structure down, but it has an opportunity to have a much bigger uh, market. And so it may have a very different profit formula in terms of its income statement, its balance sheet, in terms of these components, that the volume is much higher through the system. You know, you've brought to bring the cost structure down. Those are big changes. You know, you usually don't see a CFO talking about, I'm going to completely restructure my income statement or balance sheet. You know, they, they, he or she uses that you know, we've worked with corporations that say almost like it's gospel that every product needs to achieve a 70% or higher gross margin. And, and it's so embedded and ingrained in the organization, you know, that that's, that's where the rules, norms, and metrics come in, by the way, is to be able to use those to govern the kind of profit formula, for example, that it's using to repeatedly make, to make sure that the business model is working the way it will, because an incumbent organization has a business model and has a successful one. That's not the issue. The issue is when business models need to change. And that's when we run up to the difficulty. And then just to round this out, you know, then the, the last two boxes are resources and processes. We break those down further too. you know, that the resources are to both the tangible and the intangible assets. Some of those are easy to accumulate or to divest. Uh, processes are the routines, you know, how things get done. Um, those are tend to be more rigid than the, the resources. But anyway, those things come together to be able to meet the cost structure and to deliver the goods, to achieve the resource velocity, and to most importantly, deliver the value to the customer on a consistent, repeatable basis. And that's why, you know, we've seen over the years so much emphasis on Six Sigma and total quality management and process reengineering and improvement just to hone these processes, these business models tighter and tighter to get as most efficient, you know, most consistent quality, et cetera. And that's 90% of what a company does. But the problem is, you know, sometimes the market changes because of, of customer needs or because of technology availability. And when that happens, it's sometimes dangerous to say what we have done in the past and what we have as our unstated but powerful business model may no longer be applicable for the changes that have occurred. Said there. I absolutely loved what you said there because this is one of the huge problems you talked about a cfo there for example and the w w when you're a change maker in an organization you encounter this resistance the whole time but you what's happening is the person on the other side of the table is trying to get your idea into their head through their existing lens and you said that rules norms and metrics often are often the last element to emerge in a developing business model they may not be fully envisioned until the new product or service has been road tested and nor should they be business models need to have the flexibility to change in their early years that speaks so much to this idea of an emergent strategy that we've talked about before clay's talked about this at length and rita mcgrath talked about when she talked about discovery driven planning you need to be emergent and organizations because of that that per place of the perch of success look upon those new ideas and scorn sometimes they they go there's no money in it or it's too too small or it's not attractive this is such a massive problem when it comes to innovation it's something that time and time again even still today so many innovators and change makers come forward and, how do i get around this problem maybe you have some thoughts on that i think a few things that we've learned over the years is you know kind of some of this ties to lead from the future one of the things is there has to be enough of a shared vision about where the company's going and strategy to think about like what is going to be needed in the future financially and positioning wise to achieve 
you know, the, the relevance, the success with what the company wants to be, you know, what it, where it wants to go. And that we have found, in other words, you need the vision and strategy before the innovation. And, and so the more that there can be an understanding of gaps, of growth gaps, of, of positioning gaps, of, of new businesses that need to be developed that likely will not behave in the same way as the existing businesses, the more you have alignment and commitment to the resource allocation of taking those new nascent businesses and giving them the time to experiment and grow uh, where they're not going to do anything for the first number of years to the bottom line or to the financials. But because you have this big picture, long-term strategic lens, you get alignment and commitment behind to say, we are planting seeds for the future and we're going to give that that effort, the runway it needs to be able to be successful. So one is I think you've got to, you've got to have not just an outside in jobs to be done look, but you have to have a future back forward looking, you know, let's align on the vision piece, the strategy piece to be able to give a better rationale for why we would invest in an effort to create a new business model in the first place. And oftentimes you don't have that, that vision and that alignment. And so there's all this plenty of work to do in the core and these business model efforts seem risky. They seem distracting. Uh, They seem like somebody's, you know, experiment, uh, you know, science project, but, but you don't have that strategic rationale. So, so that's one. Second, I think is you, you got to build this language that we're talking about a language of what is a business model, what it's not, you know, how the circumstances by which you need to think about a new business model, you have to build some, you know, some competency, some mindset around it. And and then, and then I think the third piece of it is you have to provide, I guess, the right skill set and tools and structure to say, you know, we're going to, develop this in a different way than our classic product development, we do need to think about separateness. We need to think about, you know, what does it mean to kind of build an accelerator or an incubator uh, to be able to do that? It doesn't mean you have to build something big and hope everybody will come. Uh, you can start actually quite small. You can start with just a few people, but you do have to, just like you mentioned, you know, in some of the examples, you have to be cognizant of the fact that without separation, you know, you're sort of living within the the walls of a functioning, thriving business model that it's going to be at odds with trying to create something new. And you talk about that at length in dual transformation as well, the sucking sound of the core bringing you back time and time again. Let's give a couple of examples. You mentioned in the article the great example of Hilti, which went from selling drills to our power by the hour and then also there's a great example that i love this example which is one that did all the things that you talked about which is dow corning but let's start with hilti and i'll tee you up with a great quote here because this will speak to so many of our audience for hilti the greatest challenge lay in training its sales reps to do a thoroughly new task fleet management is not a half hour sale It takes days, weeks, even months of meetings to persuade customers to buy a program instead of a product. Suddenly, field reps accustomed to dealing with crew leaders and on-site purchasing managers in mobile trailers found themselves staring down CEOs and CFOs across conference tables. I thought that encapsulate the challenge so, so well. And I'm going to share again a great diagram that you accompany in, in the article to be able to articulate the idea of how Hilti changed the business model entirely. Yes. I I think that is a, that, that really is sort of a money quote, if you will. Um, You know, Hilti trying to stave off the competition. They were, they were Chinese competitors that were undercutting them on power tools, uh, you know, handheld power tools sold 
to individual consumers, but also sold to construction sites. Um, and Hilti had always been a powerful brand. You know, they, they, they were known for their quality, continue to this day. And so they just didn't want to kind of race to the bottom. Uh, they wanted to try to preserve their brand. They wanted to keep that differentiation, but they, they knew they needed to stave off commoditization. And, and so back to the jobs to be done lens, they realized that when they were working with these crews on construction sites, that it wasn't enough to just say, hey, we were selling a tool. The, there were challenges within these tools, which is if they broke down or if a piece, an accessory got lost or the tool itself got lost, um, the productivity would immediately go down uh, because the construction site, even though these were small little tools, it could it could affect the overall work plan, if you will, the the the, the process flow, and and everything would need to stop. Uh, well, you tried to go find or fix this tool, so they realized that the the real job to be done was help finish the job, and if they could support with a service where they leased or or um, did a fleet management model where they took on all the assets of the tools. And if a tool broke, Hilti could replace it for the customer. If, uh, you know, if they, they could manage the inventory so that they knew where things were in a much more efficient, effective way. So they went really from this sale of an industrial uh, professional power tool, you know, one, one at a time in a construction site, say, to actually selling the whole fleet of tools to the whole construction company, um, that would mean you wouldn't be selling to individual uh, construction workers, but you'd be selling to the CEO. Um, and it wouldn't be just a one-off sale. It would be a negotiation. It would take time. And so you had to build different skills of individuals to be able to do that. And so it was a whole different nature of sales. Um, and just by the fact that they were going to onboard all these assets meant that there would be changes in the balance sheet. And, you know, you're really, you're really dealing with now a subscription model. Um, and by the fact that you're going to manage all this inventory, um, you know, you're not only coming up with a direct sales approach, but you're going to need an IT system to be able to manage all of the uh, inventory management that would be happening for both Hilti, but also obviously for the customer and how the customer is going to account for the fact that it's, um, you know, paying for a service now, not actually paying for capital. So you can just kind of go down each major block of the business model and see the differences, you know, going from the value proposition being the sale of professional tools and accessory to leasing a comprehensive fleet of tools, the profit formula being a low margin, high inventory turn business to actually a higher margin, but asset heavy type of profit formula, making monthly payments. And then all these key resources and processes, and the operative word here is key, that the, the fundamental resources and processes that got to work together have shifted. You still have a distribution channel and you still have the need for R&D, but you have these other key resources like direct sales and IT systems management for inventory in repair and warehousing, all of those now have to come together and work in a different way. So it became very clear that you have a different business model. The interesting thing about this one, though, is it didn't have to be separated out from the core business as much because it was a higher margin accretive business that leveraged so much of what it already had. The biggest challenge was to make sure and, and test and learn, you know, being able to, uh, figure out an experiment in how to get the business model right. It wasn't as much an organizational challenge as it was just a sort of a knowledge development challenge to be able to figure out how to get this new line of business working in the right way. It's such a great, a great case study. And I, I love the Dow Corning one we'll come to in a moment. But there's just one more, more question I have before we go to Dow Corning, and then we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately, is that you should not take the idea of 
introducing a new business model lightly that you have to do your research you have to do the work you have to find out the jobs to be done etc cetera, etc cetera. but you also identify when you should and maybe you have some advice for audience on when they should actually start looking for a new business model what are the signals of change yeah so i mean i think um and i listed this in the article i may not get all five of them at, at the time and maybe we've even adjusted but there's some basic circumstances of change. So in the case of Hilti, what you were seeing was the basis of competition in the industry was shifting as it always does, going from you know pure product functionality and reliability to making something more convenient and customizable to ultimately a cost game. What Hilti was trying to do was to prevent it from being a cost game by being able to seize on the convenience and customization piece of the basis of competition. So one of the reasons for business model change is to, is to be able to get from, you know, from a, to be able to address commoditization and be able to provide convenience and customization as part of the value proposition. Oftentimes it's similar to Apple, its ability to make something super, easy and convenient with the iPod iTunes business model was how it differentiated from the others, even though they were in the early days. So one is to be able to address the shifting basis of competition um, and be able, Hilti's cases, they were able to address it uh, and convenience and customization. The other is to be able to, if you just should decide to be able to make money when things have really moved to be low cost, to be, you know, competition based on price, how do you get the cost structure down? That's a bit the Dow Corning story we could talk about. The other is nascent markets, you know, trying to go into a non-consumption, um, you know, being able to achieve new markets that have to break down the barriers of access and wealth in general. You know, I always use the example consumer packaged good companies like Procter and Gamble and Johnson and Johnson, when they're trying to go overseas into emerging markets, uh, if they don't, if they, they, they can change the packaging and they can hire people that are local to the country, but if they really want to get to the emerging middle class, they need to change more than just the product and the packaging. They need to change the business model because you're dealing with non-consumption and you're dealing with people that purchase items not in a in a full bottle of shampoo, but in a single use sachet, and that is a different business model. And it's it, and it's a way to create democratization to to create access to individuals that can't afford otherwise. That requires a business model behind it to be able to do that. One of the great great studies you talk about is the Dow Corning case and. This is the real innovator's dilemma where it's like, going, okay, I have low end dis disruptors coming at me. Do I go and create that myself? And how do I do that and still maintain the organization and the products at a high level and a high yield as well? And in 2002, you tell us Gary Anderson, who was the CEO, asked the executive Don Sheets to go and cannibalize the business in some way and create this low end uh, disruptor from within. And he set up an experimental war game to test how existing staff and systems would react to the requirements of the new customer value proposition. How did it go? You tell us. <laughs> he got absolutely crushed as entrenched habits and existing processes thwarted any attempt to change the game. It became clear that the corporate antibodies would kill the initiative before it got off the ground. Welcome to innovation. Welcome to transformation. That's what happens. But luckily, this is a success story. Over to you, Mark. I, I think it was a success story because I mean, what's interesting in a very simple way is um, Gary Anderson tasked John Sheets with, you know, take a few million bucks and do something on the Internet. I mean, that was another angle at this, right, was to say these were in the days, early days of the Internet, and they could see the potential to be able to leverage um, – you know, SAP and the ERP system and, and the technology of being online and having a portal, you know, for individual customers to be able to sell and, and distribute in a different way and get individual, you know, 
manpower out of the equation, knowing that there was a set of SKUs of silicone. Believe it or not, there's 7,400 SKUs when we wrote the case. And, you know, having a pretty clear understanding that there was a set, I think at the time they thought of it around 400, that they said, mm, this, is a, this is a kind of set of silicone SKUs that doesn't need technical services, doesn't really need a sales force. People use it in a very basic way. They've used it for a very long time. We should try to sell this in a way that we can compete by bring, bring the price down, but also bring the cost structure down so that we don't lose on margins. And, and that's where the internet, that's where SAP came in and inventory management. The build a business called Diameter, where basically, you know, by creating some rigid rules, you know, there wasn't price negotiation, you had to take it in a certain volume, contract terms were very rigid, they could only be a certain way. If you needed to make anything that was customized about the transaction, you had to pay a premium. Otherwise, it was basically, hey, go to this portal, put in your order for these available SKUs, and, and we'll sell it to you in a freight train car or in a, in a very limited uh, volume type of container, um, and we'll get this to you, you know, in a much lower price. So that was the, you know, that was, that was the proposition is basically we will we will make some rigid rules and metrics. Uh, we'll get many of the resources out of the equation to be able to do this in a more automated way. Um, but that required them to not only separate the business, but almost call it, they called it a different name because they didn't want to cannibalize their more higher end technical sales, you know, R and D support side of the business. Um, but the beauty of it was it allowed the customer to get the best um, offering for their needs uh, at the right price. And it also made sure that they could overall uh, just sort of maintain a full complement and a full volume of their business and, and, and maximize their capacity in the plants. And the core component there, as you say, is patience, successful new businesses, typically revise their business models four times or so on the road to profitability. That is such a core element. There's a, a French poet, Guillaume Apollinaire, and he said that what are butterflies after all, but caterpillars that persevered. And I thought, often think of a business model in that respect. The last thing, Mark, and is firstly where people can find you. And then your final words on your great friend, Clay Christensen. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and as far as Clay goes, you know, my, my tribute to Clay is that, that his contribution was as much about teaching all of us what it means to be, um, to be not afraid to share elements at least of who you are as a person um, in, in with people that maybe you don't even know that well, but try to be an influence for good that way, as much as what you can offer intellectually, you know, sort of in the business lexicon. And I think that's what really down deep, everybody so appreciated about him. Even though when we think about it ourselves, maybe we'd be a little bit uncomfortable with people we don't know sharing some things about our moral compass. But, but to me, one of Clay's just great, great contributions is being able to, to be bold with his moral, you know, what, what, what he felt was the morally important things to have right in your life. And, and whether you agreed with those or not, it opened up a conversation It opened up a, a reflection that I think was so powerful for so many people. And that's why I think he's been so admired and, you know, why we celebrate him now.
Absolutely beautiful, Mark. And it's always such a great pleasure talking to you. We're we've covered Lead from the Future in the past. We're going to cover some of your older titles in the future. And for now, co-author of that 2008 article, Reinventing Your Business Model alongside your great friend, Clay Christensen, Mark W. Johnson. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aidan. Before we wrap up today, thank you to our sponsor, Nexus Estate, specialists in buying, selling and managing property in the Berlin market in Germany. You can find Next Estate at next-estate.com.